Well, good morning again. If we haven't met, my name is Brad Cheney. I'm one of the pastors here at All Saints. We've been studying the Ten Commandments for the last two months, so we're nearing the end of that sermon series, and we come to the eighth word, the eighth commandment. A lot of people look at the eighth commandment sort of as breathing room. <laughs> we're kind of like, phew, I'm glad I don't struggle with this one. Um, you know, like I, I read a survey, 86% of Christians say that they have not broken the Eighth Commandment ever since they became Christians. And I think that's the common assumption. The assumption is that this is the easiest of the ten to keep. Uh, you know, I don't do Grand Theft Auto. I don't rob banks. You know, I, I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm, I'm good with keeping this commandment. But actually, that was one of the key mistakes that the rich young ruler of all people made in Luke chapter 18. Well, we read there in the story that he was a man of great wealth, and yet there's nothing that indicates he had gotten that wealth unlawfully. Um, but when Jesus says that he needs to give generously to the poor, he needs to take his wealth and uh, his possessions and give it away, of course he wasn't willing to do that, and he, he, he turned away from Christ. And what Jesus implies in that story is not only does he break the first commandment, that he has a God above the Lord, but that our possessions are meant to bless other people uh, and to help our neighbor. And so while we might say the uh, rich and ruler wasn't a white-collar thief, he wasn't a blue-collar thief, but he was a green-collared thief. And I, I think that's the kind of thief we are all tempted to be. More on that in a moment. Before we read the passage, very short passage, uh, let's pray together one more time. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, we ask that you would cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the grace of your Holy Spirit through your word, that we may obey this commandment joyfully, fully, and in so doing, worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, we ask this. Amen. And God spoke all of these words, saying, I am Yahweh your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall not steal. And then we read from Larger Catechism 141. And you know, the reason I've included these catechism questions every week, I, I think it's helpful to see how a different generation of Christians who are deep thinkers uh, unpack something so simple and small as the commandments. And then, I, I mean, I know that we go through them so quickly, you can't process all of this in the course of a Sunday morning sermon. But hopefully you take your bulletin home with you. And um, I mean, because we do love and worship God, we want to give deeper contemplation and thought to the way that we're living our lives. And so these could be, I envision that they might be tools for you to do so, you know, during your quiet time during the week, for instance. But what does the Eighth Commandment require? The Eighth Commandment requires us to act truthfully, faithfully, and justly in all our contractual and business relationships with our fellow human beings so that we give to all what they deserve. We are to make restitution for anything we have unlawfully acquired. We should give and lend freely according to our ability and the needs of others. We must moderate our judgment, will, and inclinations about worldly goods. To do in life and work hard at it, we should be frugal. Finally, we must do our best by all just and lawful means to acquire, preserve, and increase our own and our own and others' monies, money and possessions. Interesting. Then what particular sins does the Eighth Commandment forbid? In addition to failing to do what is required, the Eighth Commandment forbids theft, robbery, kidnapping, and receiving stolen goods, fraud, dishonest scales or measures, removing boundary markers, injustice or bad faith in our contractual relationships or trust agreements, oppression, extortion, usury, that, that is excessive interest rates, bribery, harassing lawsuits, illegal work or activities, and all other unjust or sinful ways of taking, withholding, or enriching ourselves from what belongs to others, 
avarice, excessive attachment to or display of our worldly goods, allowing ourselves to become distracted from trusting God in the way that we acquire, maintain, and use worldly goods. This is long, isn't it? Uh, Envying the prosperity of others and also laziness, extravagance, wasteful gambling, and all other ways that needlessly jeopardize our money and possessions and defraud ourselves of the use and comfort of the things that God has given us. By a show of hands, how many of us have ever been victims of theft before? So all, per 90% of us. And how did you feel inside when that happened to you? All of us have the experience of a, uh, for lack of a better word, a visceral reaction that takes place deep inside us when someone steals from us. It's a sense of violation. It's a sucker punch. It's a gut punch. And it could be something as innocuous as you, you left your garage door open last night. You forgot to put it down. And somebody came in and they took one of your kid's bicycles. Uh, and you say to yourself afterwards, well, it was only, what, a hundred bucks. It really wasn't a, a big deal. But isn't it true? That's not how you feel inside. Like you feel as though you were violated. You feel deeply wronged. And here's the reason for that. It's a very simple reason. Um, and it's implied in the Eighth Commandment. It's this. God really cares about personal property rights. Like, why else would he make one of the Ten Commandments about not stealing if there isn't something almost sacred about our, our owning of personal possessions? What I think the Eighth Commandment does, it assumes there is something about us put in there by God, put into us, that we really do need to have and to take care of and enjoy physical things. Another way to put it, stuff is good. You know, we talk a lot about how stuff is bad, but, but no, fundamentally, stuff is good. And wealth creation. And if you have any doubt of that, just go to the Old Testament and read what was one of the principal benefits of the covenant that God made with Israel in the Old Testament. It was the benefit of national prosperity. It was the benefit of home ownership for people who had never had a home before. And the benefit of agricultural productivity and, and ownership. So here's an, another way that I can put it. The reason we feel so violated when someone steals from us is they have taken away from us that tiny slice of this world that God has given to you and said, it's yours. I mean, the world's big, the universe is really big, but the marvel is that God takes a very tiny slice of it, and he says, here, my child, this is yours for you to take care of, to use, and even to enjoy this little sliver of creation I give to you. Likely, the way you acquired it was through the work of your hands, the sweat of your brow, and honest day's wages, and God ordered the world in such a way so that you would get to enjoy the fruit of your hard work. And when somebody breaks that cycle and takes that little slice that your father has given you, um, you know, it's a universal feeling across all societies. Now, I'm sure you're aware of the fact that not everyone believes personal property rights are a, girl, uh, are a good thing. Yeah, before there was a Karl Marx, there was a Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And if you've, you know anything about that French Enlightenment philosopher, Jean-Jacques Rousseau hated the idea of private property. Uh, and he, he really precedes Marx in his thinking. He argued, uh, you remember this in, in philosophy class, that in the state of nature, in our kind of pre um, societal caveman existence, which he called the state of nature, uh, there were no fences. That's what he said famously. There were no fences in the state of nature. Everything believed to every, uh, belonged, rather, sorry. Everything belonged to everybody. And he said, really, the, what we're trying to do in this life is to get ourselves back to that day where there are no more fences, where there is no more private property, where all of that is abolished, uh, where everyone shares everything. 
And curiously enough about Rousseau, he didn't even believe in parental rights. So he made a complete mess of his life, ended up, ended up giving his kids to the city of Geneva for their care. So Rousseau was, uh, in some respects, he was for the hippie commune before that was ever a thing. <laughs> and, and a lot of Marx's ideas um, were derived from Rousseau. But, you know, that's of course not at all what God designed for, uh, for human life to be. Kids or, or parents, uh, those of you who have had toddlers or do have toddlers, you know that they learn the word mine very early in life. And it drives us nuts because everything is mine. <laughs> but what we do sometimes is we overreact to that. And it's very important that you realize that personal pronoun is not a, a bad, dirty word. That they need to know that some things are mine. My blanket is my blanket, which means it's off limits to my brothers and sisters. There's, there are possessions that are mine and that I am safe to enjoy. They are not part of the community trust. And it's a God-given distinction that we have to teach them at a very early age. Sometimes we as Christians will have kind of a spiritual boast. We'll, we'll say about, about our wealth, well, it's, it's, it's only stuff, or it's just a bunch of junk. I don't care much about it, and somehow that's a spiritual boast. But I think, you know, fundamentally, the Eighth Commandment dignifies our stuff. It says it's good, and God gives it to you to use and to enjoy. So that's the first point. Let's turn our attention now then to a not-so-inspiring topic, and that is the violations of the Eighth Commandment. Um, the Catechism does a really good job of providing an exhaustive list of various forms of theft, but what I thought I'd try and do is highlight a, a few modern examples that are important. First, music piracy and so College students, high school students, um, suppose you're in a band and you're trying to make your living in the music industry. Would it bother you if someone decided they would spread the word about your band by copying a song and sending it to the rest of their friends? Would that bother you? Probably not. Would it bother you if someone was standing at the counter of the record exchange planning to buy your album when a friend uh, tells them to oh, put it back on the shelf? I have it copied on my phone, and I'll just give it to you. Well, yeah, that would bother you a whole lot, wouldn't it? Because they're stealing your artist. It's, they're stealing, it's, it's effectively intellectual theft, and it happens all the time. It's commonplace, and nobody thinks anything of it. What would you do? Would you turn it back in to the, uh, to the authorities? And you know what the most common response is? It depends. It depends if it belonged to the rich or not. <laughs> if, it was, if it belonged to a, a, a poor person, of course, I guess that's an oxymoron. How do they have a briefcase of half a mil if they're poor? But they would say, if it belongs to a poor person, then I would give it back to them. If it belongs to a rich person, I won't give it back to them. Because there is a tremendous amount of resentment between the rich and the poor in our country. And many believe that the rich are the sheriff of Nottingham and that it's acceptable to steal from them. That's why it's not a big deal if you steal from big business or large department stores if you can shoplift a tiny thing, because they're loaded. Oh, we see this with frivolous medical malpractice lawsuits against doctors and hospitals. That's a, that is it. Why do you think your health, well, you know, what you spend on health insurance and such is, is so high? It's because it's a chronic problem. And we think it's not that big of a deal because they're the big cheese. But a lot of that resentment, it all it stems from Robin Hood syndrome. Uh, number three, by far the largest amount of theft in America is conducted, is done by employees. You probably knew that. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce estimates that 75% of employees steal from their companies. 
it's reported that one-third of all U.S. corporate bankruptcies were directly caused by employee theft. And then the American Society of Employers estimates that 20% of every dollar earned by a U.S. company is lost to employee theft. And what makes it into the newspaper are the, the times where somebody is caught embezzling a large amount of funds. But it's important for us to realize that God sees the small things. I mean, what are the, maybe what are the kinds of things we're tempted to do? Are we tempted to fudge our expense report? to put just a little bit more on there this month, and we justify it because, hey, there were other expenses I forgot to include in the month before. Um, are we tempted to uh, filch a, to a, a printer toner cartridge? <laughs> or, um, you know, uh, how about this? Some of you guys have worked on a maintenance crew or a construction crew, and you started your job, you were, you were very hardworking and conscientious, and then a member of that crew, one of the older employees, took you aside and, and said, in effect, you better slow down or you're going to make the rest of us look bad. Did that ever happen to you? Yeah. And that's, that is employee theft. It's a theft of time. Consider this. What happens when corporate America and regular Joe America are both thieving from each other? Do you know what we call that? We call that the 2008 housing bubble. <laughs> and it burst, didn't it? We had predatory lenders who wrote bad mortgages because they could and collected fees from people who really didn't need to refinance, but the market was hungry and they could get away with it. We had predatory appraisers who they needed the work that the lenders brought their way. So houses were appraised far too high and the industry could justify it as long as the housing prices is kept going up. We had many borrowers. They estimated that of homes that foreclosed in the first year, 70% of the borrowers falsified their loan application. They falsified their income, their assets, their employment, their credit history, or whether or not they intended to live in a house that they were purchasing. And then we had builders. I mean, the market was so hot, they were throwing up houses so fast. Many of those houses were not well constructed. And that too is a form of theft. I mean, how many of us parents have bought an expensive toy for our kids and look, within the first week, the toy breaks? That's a form of theft. Um, but you could get away with it back in 2008 until the bubble burst. And that is how we ended up in a national multi-year recession. Finally, again, I know this is not the most... Uh, inspiring part of the sermon, but corporate theft. Lewis Meads, who wrote a great book on ethics, put it this way. He says, we know that when a thug snatches a woman's purse, he is stealing. But you know what? So is an advertising agent who woos money from people by subtle and seductive marketing half-truths. We know that an embezzler is stealing from a bank when he falsifies computer data, but so is a corporation that bribes elected officials to get a deal, but justifies it because it's not a bribe, it's just merely a perk of business. We know that a burglar who takes a poor family's television is stealing, but, but so is a company when it exploits a poor nation's resources or fails to pay its employees a livable wage. A lot there to think about. Let's personalize it. What was the very first thing you stole? You're not part of the 86%, I'm assuming. <laughs> At least I, I'm not. And I, I may have told you the story before, but the very first thing I stole was a baseball card. I stole it from Jeff, Jeff Wunsch, who lived right down the road. He was a big Milwaukee Brewers fan. And I had no interest in the Milwaukee Brewers. I was an Atlanta Braves fan as a kid. But he the best, and he had so many Brewers cards, he's not going to miss just one. Do you remember Raleigh Fingers, the guy with the handlebar mustache? So I took his Raleigh Fingers card, and I just hid it behind one of my cards, showed him, see, this is, uh, I'm taking this home, home with me, my card. How did my dad figure out that I had done it? I think because I came to him and said, Dad, you'll never guess what I did. I was very proud of, um, <laughs> Smart kid, wasn't I? Very proud of my theft. And dad...
us have stories like this, march yourself right back down that road, son, and apologize and give the card back, um, which was a great thing for my dad to do. But if there was one quibble that I have looking back on it, my dad should have made me do one more thing. He should have made me pay restitution. Because that is a fun... It's a fundamental principle in the Bible. I could read you numerous passages from the book of Deuteronomy or the book of Exodus, which basically say something like this. If a man steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it or sells it, he must pay back five head of cattle for the ox or four sheep for the sheep. If a man is found with stolen goods, then he must pay back double than what he, he took. It's restitution. Uh, you always pay back more than what you take. Is there anyone whom you've stolen for, uh, stolen from, and you've never done that? You never paid restitution. It's a question that you're never asked in a sermon, but this is the appropriate time to do so. Is there, is there anyone you, you've unlawfully taken from that you need to go and make it right? Please do. On to more positive things. Uh, the key verse on the Eighth Commandment, in my estimation, is not found in Exodus chapter 20, but it's actually found in the New Testament, in the writings of the Apostle Paul, in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 28, where here Paul is confronting the question, when is a thief not a thief? When is theft reversed? Is it when she, he or she simply stops stealing? And he says, no, listen to this. It's such a simple exhortation, but it's profound. Listen to this. He says, anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their hands so that they may have something to share with those who are in need. What's he saying by that? He's saying you're not, you haven't stopped being a thief when you stop taking. You're, you're not even no longer a thief when you have started working. He says if you hold on to all that you have earned and you spend it all on yourself, provocatively, he's implying that you're still a thief. That you must, you must make so that you have enough to give to someone else who has need. That's, that's just the clear thing he says there in Ephesians 4. You say, how can he say that? Well, it goes back to the fundamental, fundamental principle of ultimate ownership. When you know the ultimate ownership of anything, it completely changes the way you relate to that possession. For example, if you are, let's say you're borrowing a friend's car, nice car. Do you drive that car like Dale Earnhardt Jr.? <laughs> What do you do with that car? You find yourself, you're five miles an, hour, miles an hour under the speed limit, and you're parking in the distant spaces of the parking lot away from other cars so that it won't get dinged up. Um, it's happened to you before you're borrowing somebody else's book, and somebody sees what you're reading, and they're like, oh, uh, can, I, can I read that book when you're done? And what do you have to say to them? You can, you can say, well, I'm sorry, but... I don't own it, and so it's not mine to lend. It belongs to someone else. And so the foundational principle, and we know this, but I'm reminding you, the foundational principle is everything I've got is from my Father. Every cent, every inch, everything has, given to me, has been given to me by my Heavenly Father. And while I may own it, ultimately I don't own it. Ultimately, it is his, and he owns it. And we are but steward owners. We are but managers and trustees of that which he owns. It's not rocket science, but it is revolutionary if you really think and apply it. It profoundly changes your mindset on how you choose to use your possessions. If you see your money and possessions as ultimately yours, the, the idea of giving, giving it away promiscuously in generous proportions will be upsetting and unfair to you. But if you see all of your stuff as having been given to you by your father, there's an ease about, you know, giving it away because 
It's my dad's. And dad said that I'm supposed to give it away in generous proportions. What does our father want us to do with what we have? He wants us to use our earthly goods for his priorities and to use it to advance the kingdom of his son in this world. If he is the owner and I'm just the caretaker and I internalize that sufficiently, then it really does free me up to be generous. Amen? It does. And yet we say amen and we're, uh, <laughs> it's hard for us. We're begrudging. I've already thrown too many stats at you today, so why not throw some more? <laughs> American Christians, so how much do they give to charitable causes? Their average annual income, what percentage of that is given to charitable church and non-church causes? 2.9% of their average annual income. Less than 9% of American Christians give away a tithe or more of their income, less than 9%. And just slightly over 20% of American Christians give a big fat goose egg, nothing, to charitable causes. You know, most of us would say we're not aspiring to become mega wealthy. We're not. We, we don't want to be filthy rich. We just need another 30 grand in order to be generous, right? We just need to pad our future retirement savings a little bit more. I'll talk about that before I finish the sermon. But here's just a great diagnostic question to ask yourself. Do I see myself as the owner and controller of my assets, or am I viewing myself as a manager and trustee of what God has given to me? And are there things that God would have me manage differently if I acknowledge that it really belongs to him and not to me? Uh, the other key passage, and really the, the richer passage in my estimation is, on this issue, is found also written by the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. I'll give you a little bit of background on the passage, and then I'll read it to you. In that verse, Paul is trying to encourage the Corinthian church to provide a sizable famine relief donation to uh, the Christians who are back in Jerusalem. Um, support the famine relief efforts. The Christians in Jerusalem were persecuted and they were starving. And so how does Paul then go about persuading a church to be promiscuously generous? Unsurprisingly, he uses the gospel. Here's how he says it, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know the gospel, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. He became poor. It, you, you get the shovel out and you start digging into that word. Like, how poor did Jesus become? I mean, he became poorer than any human being ever. Poor so that he was stripped naked and he was plunged into the abyss. And he did that, Paul says, so that you might become rich. From his poverty would come your riches. And the riches he's talking about are, are not material riches in this case. It's being holy in God's sight, being righteous in God's sight, having the Holy Spirit in your life, uh, having an eternal inheritance as your future reward. But if you follow the gospel logic, uh, it, it, it compels you to a certain way of life. I love how the old prominent Princeton theologian B.B. Warfield uh, wrote about this gospel logic. He, he said, you know, somebody might, might say, my money is my own. Really? Christ might have said, my blood is my own. My life is my own. Then where would that have left us? Someone may say, the poor are undeserving. Christ might have said, God, these people are rebels. <laughs> Shall I lay down my life for these? I'm going to give my life for the good angels. But no, he left the 99 and came after the lost. He gave his blood for the undeserving. And then finally, somebody may say, the poor will abuse it. They'll abuse my gift. And the answer I say is, Christ, Christ could have said the same. Yea, Christ knew that thousands would trample his blood under their feet, 
that would, uh, the most would despise it, and that many would make an excuse for sinning more, and yet he gave his own blood. And here's how he concludes. He concludes, my dear Christians, if you would be like Christ, and how is Christ? Christ is fully joyful, um, fully happy. If you would be like Christ, give much, give often, give freely to the vile and to the poor and to the thankless and to the undeserving. For Christ is glorious and happy, and so will you be. And that's not the prosperity gospel. That is the words of Christ himself. It is more blessed, more happy to give than it is to receive. And I thought, oh man, hit me in the heart. That is so true. It's so true. How do we become radically generous people? If you think about Christ's poverty and our riches, the pain of radical giving no longer becomes a pain. <laughs> it's a joy. And if you think of the incredible riches you have in Christ, then uh, your, your whole disposition to your possessions is changed. Let me finish by talking about retirement. I know that's a strange, seem like it would seem like a strange place to conclude a sermon, and I suppose it is, but I'm definitely preaching it myself on this last, last point. I preach it myself on all the points, but this one especially. When the Israelites left Egypt, and they went into the wilderness. There was obviously no stores there. There, was, there were no farms there in the wilderness. It was a desert. Uh, there, there was no food there during those 40 years. Well, we know God provided them manna. I mean, maybe they killed wildlife and found herbs and plants, but for the most part, the, the staple of their diet was this thing called manna, which in Hebrew, do you know what manna means in Hebrew? It means, what is this? <laughs> and, you know, God made this rain down from the sky supernaturally. He caused it to fall like dew on the ground. It would dry out, and some kind of flaky sort of food would be there that you gathered, and you'd most likely make it into bread. Well, one of the provisions God made is that uh, he said, I'm going to make it fall almost every day. And you're to go out at the beginning of the day, you're to gather your manna, but on the sixth day, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cause twice as much to fall. And what was his reason for that? It was so that you wouldn't have to work on the seventh day. So he said, go out and, and gather twice as much on the sixth day so you can eat on the seventh day. But on all the other days, what do I want you to do? I don't want you to gather extra. You're not supposed to build this hoard of manna. And uh, if you know the story, several of them try to do so. They gather more than they should on one day, and it, it, their manna store just begins to rot. It's got maggots in it. It, it begins to, you know, decay in front of them. And, and God said that would happen. Why would the Israelites try to gather too much when they had watched it fall every day without fail for 40 years? Because I think it's so deep in our hearts. We're on, our inclination, the inclination of our hearts is, yeah, God came through for the last 10 years, but what about tomorrow? <laughs> what about tomorrow? Uh, how do we know he'll come through again? And deep in every one of our hearts is this desire for a buffer. We want a buffer in case times go bad. We, most of us are savers. If you probably look at the demographics of the room, we, we save. We save a lot. And the Bible says savings are good and it's good to save. But we save a lot. And it begs this question. I'll ask it to you. I'll ask it to me. How much retirement do you want? How much do you, how much do you need? I mean, I know what I want. I want enough retirement so that if the world goes to hell in a hands basket, I will be good. I'll have exactly what I need. I, if God doesn't come through on that day of economic apocalypse, I'll be fine and I'll still be able to go travel the country and see the grandkids and play golf and do all of that. I want, I want a money pot of retirement security. And I've got to build that up before I don't feel anxious about... Um, giving away to, 
to, to gener generously to causes. And I know that it's tough to discern what is wisdom about savings and what is hoarding. Um, but here's the last diagnostic question that I'd pose to you. How much money do you need? And will your answer always be more? Or can I set a finish line for myself, a line in the sand, and start to give everything away beyond that? I think we probably all know instinctively that our faith would be stronger if we had less. <laughs> I mean, where is it in the world today where the church is shrinking? It's in the most affluent places in Europe, in America. And where is the church exploding? It's in all the places where there is less. So just keep that in mind. It's so simple. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands so that they may have something to share with those who are in need. That little piece of the world that God has given to you is to be enjoyed, but it is also to be shared with the purpose of helping heal this world. We don't want to be white-collared thieves or blue-collared thieves or even green-collared thieves because Jesus Christ has saved us for something better than that. Amen? Amen.